Hello, welcome to T Quotes Live. Hi, everybody. I see I got a few people coming in. I don't expect a lot of people today because we do not have a topic. I didn't select one in advance, at least. So what I'm doing today is I've had a few questions, and I've got a couple of the questions twice. And I sometimes will get questions in my comment section, and other times people will email me their questions so I thought that I would answer those and then we can go from there so we're just getting people to get into the chat room I see a few of the shout outs coming in I try to start when we have at least 25 people and I can't see how many people I have because my machine is not letting me see that right now i think i have okay so i have 27 now so thank you everybody for coming and we've got linda short from finley ohio hi linda welcome to my channel she says she loves me thank you linda i love that you all come in here with me every wednesday night we got sue she says evening scenes i'm the first in Got Robin from RS Islands Crafts. She's in Florida. Got Hannah Beauty Love. Hi from Toronto. Hi, Hannah. Liz Ryan from New Orleans. She says, Good evening. Happy you are on tea. Got Donna from Texas. Hi, Donna. Welcome. Lauren's here. She's from Dallas, Texas. That's Lauren King from Dallas, Texas. We got Kaylin from Stitched Art Studio from Ottawa, Canada. She says, hi, T and everyone. IG is at Stitched Art Studio. So she's giving you her Instagram site. Got uh, Kathy Hopkins from Ontario. Sue says that 29 are watching. Yeah, we're kind of, I'm on a delay, you all. Um, are getting things kind of delayed for me, and then I'm also getting it delayed back from you. So we have Solove. Solove, what's your name? I can't remember. She's from New York. Got Pamela from Humble, Texas. Welcome, Pamela. Got Nancy from Central California. Gloria from Chatham, Ontario, got Linda from Erie, Michigan, and Allie is from Covington, Louisiana. We have Sharon, good evening from Michigan. Darlene's here, greetings from a snowy northern Virginia. <laughs> yeah, I know it's weird, we're still having snow and it's spring now. Hey, I just got a beep, so I don't know what that means. I'm hoping that it doesn't do a public service announcement, which my speaker will do. We got, um, let's see, Marjorie Blackwell, first time for me from Indiana. Hi, I hope I said your name wrong. If I didn't, I apologize. And so love's name is, her first name's Evelyn. I'm not gonna say her last name. We got uh, Claudette from, Anaheim, California. Got my home phone is now ringing. So um, I got a lot going on, but I'm going to ignore that. My husband is here. If he, if it's an emergency, he'll get me. Uh, we have Bonita. Hi, Bonita. I was just um, communicating with her on YouTube. We got Dars from Kensington, Tennessee. Welcome, Dars. And Okay, so 
I have just a few questions and I just thought that I would answer them here. And so since I have some items on my desk, I'll go ahead and start with put labels. I have been getting a couple of questions. One was, how do I apply it to the back of the quilt? And then I had another question just this week on using the machine embroidery to make the label. So I thought, and I've had this question before, so I thought I would go ahead and handle this during the session tonight since I didn't have a topic. Of course, when you're making machine embroidered labels, we're doing them with a hoop and you've already programmed your label either at your software on your computer and then I will transfer mine to a USB drive. I can also hook this machine up to my computer as well, but it's just easier for me not to have everything in here. And or your some embroidery machines have alphabets that are built in that you can just type the information into the screen and then you can make your label from there. It's just easier for me to do at the computer because when you're doing it on the machine, every row you will have to stop and enter that data. And it's just easier for me to do in my software on my machine. The software that I actually use is Custom Works, which is by Designers Gallery. It's their old software. I'm not even sure if they sell it anymore because once you buy a base system, I wasn't looking for anything super fancy. And so I bought a lot of the individual packages of designers galleries, like custom work. I have quilt work. And then I have, I forgot what it's actually called. It's some kind of a studio, designer studio, where I can also view my files for my embroidery machine on the screen before I select them for printing. So that's a whole nother video on that. And if it's requested, we can do that. I'll go into a little bit more in depth on a live video. I don't know how I can do that, but we'll try. So um, the main thing is when you're using the hoop that you should hoop your stabilizer. There are some times when you can actually float your um, things that you embroider. When you're making a label, that is not the time to be floating. You want to actually hoop your stabilizer and your fabric together. And most of the time, if I don't have any fabric left over from my backing, I'll just use a piece of muslin. I always just keep a strip in my room. I don't cut it to size because what I do is when I put this into the hoop, I move the file up as far to the top as it can go. And then I just trim off whatever is left. What I use to stabilize, so I would hoop this. And I just have tearaway here. I actually like to use tearaway. I have tried to use the cut, I forgot what it's called, I'm blocking right now, but the stabilizer that you leave in. And I just find that I like the tearaway better. And then the funny thing is, I actually leave this in anyway. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Once I get both of these things hooked together, there's a formula with embroidery that I think a lot of people miss. If you, for every 10,000 stitches that you are machine embroidering, you should have a layer of interfacing. Now, I'm only going to hoop one layer of stabilizer, and what I'm going to do is float the remaining pieces underneath. So let's just assume that this is hooped with a piece of fabric and stabilizer and I put this onto my machine so it's sitting flat on the bed. What I would do for every additional 10,000 pieces of stabilizer, I'm going to float a layer of stabilizer. Now you could use the tearaway or you can use something else. I find that I like to use something a little bit different and I don't know if it would even show up on the screen, but this is actually polypropylene. So it's a stabilizer and it tears. And all I do when I take it out the machine, as you can see here, is I just take it out from the stitching that I have in my frame of my quilt label. And I'll show you a label that I'm actually working on right now. But this is what it looks like. Let me make sure this is right side up. I actually buy this at Joann's. 
and I purchase it by the boat. Whenever they have interfacing on sale, they also have stabilizers and also a uh, fusible web would be on sale anytime it says interfacing. So that's when I go and purchase the entire boat and then I can just cut off what I need as I go. I like this because like I said, it's polypropylene. It's got a, a weird type of a feel to it where it feels like it could be a glossy um, paper or towel or something like that, but then it also tears really easy. So I can just pull it off. So what I do is when I make my labels, I do a row of satin stitches around the outside and that's where I have pulled this off of the machine. So let me just show you, I'm working on a quilt now that I just did a label for before I decided to add this into my talk tonight. So I've got a big something here I'm trying to maneuver. But basically this is the stitching that I pulled out from that stabilizer, it's already been sewn down. And I actually left both of those stabilizers in here. Because I had this satin stitch on and I used tear away, it was very easy for me to just tear the stabilizers away from the outside. I don't mind, it's not that bulky. I'm gonna see if you can hear it. So it's a little, crunchy in there, but not a whole lot. And it's not any stiffer. You don't see it from the front of the quilt at all. So I just go ahead and leave it in there because I find when you have a lot of laddering and you start trying to pull the stabilizer from around the individual ladders that then it will start to pull as well. So sometimes I try to answer, and I did answer the question when it was asked of me on YouTube, but it's very difficult for me to get very detailed without showing you what I actually mean. So we're gonna go to see if we got some new viewers here. We have Barbara from Lake Falls. Hi, Barbara, welcome. Got Joni Foot. Hi, T from New York. Hi, welcome. Got Denise Mann. She says she finally made it. Welcome to the T Quilts Live. We got Miss J.A. Coleman. And we've got Sam's Creates and Designs. Hey T, it's 12, 10 a.m. here in Scotland. Well, welcome and thank you for being up with me. And Denise says she's from Collarville, Tennessee. She says your picture is too blurry for us to see the product. So would you recommend using a serger to make a quilt? So let me first go to the product. I put it up. Let me read it to you. And that's the problem with videotaping on my laptop camera because it's very dark in here, but it's not as dark as the camera says it is. But it's by Pelon. And the number, you know, they always have a number on Pelon. And this one says number 360. And it's called Embroidery Interfacing Dash Tear Away 360 Easy Stitch. And it's 100% polypropylene, machine wash warm, tumble dry low, or dry clean. And it's 20 inches. And it's um, made in the USA. On this particular boat, now I could have had this for a couple of years since I buy it by the boat, but it says it's $2.99. So let me try again, and I'm sure it's not going to pick up, but I that's the best I can do. We have June Hansen. Have... Seems like my mic just went out. <laughs> I'm gonna to try to reset it and see if it comes back.
Okay, so I can't get my mic to reset right now. I don't know what the problem is. So we're just going to go ahead. I'll try to speak a little louder because I know the volume is bad on the laptop. So the question of would I recommend a serger to do a quilt? It depends on what you're doing. If you're doing a quilt where you're just sewing rows together, then you probably could use a serger. But if you're using making a quilt block that requires for various different pieces, a solid piece to be added to a piece unit, then I would not recommend a serger because I don't think you can control your seam allowance down to that one quarter inch as well as you can on a sewing machine. I have Sharon saying that my mic is okay, but I don't hear it. So just a second. I have everything on, so. And I've got power, so I don't know why it's not working. So we'll just carry on. I have to figure it out later. Um, I've got another person saying that the picture is blurry. I don't know what to do about that because that is the camera that I'm using my webcam. So I don't know how to make any adjustments to that, especially being in Google Hangouts. Hi, Debbie. Okay, so next question was, I had a question asking me about a particular quilt block called the True Lovers link, and I could not find that block when I tried to link it. And we talked, I had another question about this when I did, the, when we did the video where I was talking about how to design quilts, I wasn't talking about blocks per se. So I thought that I would do a quick run on how to size blocks or decipher how blocks are made. We got Kathy saying that uh, looks and sound good here. We got Jackie say hi T from Ontario, Canada. Love tuning in to get all your tips. I'm fairly new to quilting, need all the help I can get. Well, welcome Jackie. And I have a, a whole lot of videos out there if you got any questions. And if you still got questions, you can always leave it in any comment section of any video. Be more than willing to help if I can. Darlene Farmer says, do you use light, medium, or heavy interfacing for embroidery? I tend to experience puckers. Um, when I use my interfacing, I take the label off and I just stick it inside. So I'll tell you exactly what it is. This is Baby Locks Interfacing. It's a medium tearaway. And here's the Baby Lock logo down here. And on this, it's saying that it's 1.5 ounce tearaway embroidery stabilizer. Hi, Erica. We got Erica here. And so we're going to go ahead and talk about resizing some quilt blocks. So let's see. We're going to be back to the board, which is interesting in itself. So what I've done is I've just drawn um, this block is called the Evening Star. And you would think that this is a nine patch block when you first look at it, but it's actually a 16 patch block. And I will explain why. Whenever you normally have a flying geese, you have a square and a square, and then you have a flying geese. This flying geese is really representing two of those squares. And so if I was dissecting this block, this would actually be a 16 patch block. And it may just look like it's a 
nine patch block when you're first looking at it. And that's why I picked this particular block. So let's just say that we wanted to make a block that was 16 inches square. So if I've got one, two, three, four columns, then that means I've got to divide four by my finished size, which is 16. So if I divide four into 16, that's four inches. So what that means is each of these sections need to be four inches. So when I do that, remember we when we start cutting, we've got to now add back in our seam allowance. So this would be 4.5, would be your four squares all the way around. And then when we get to the flying geese part, remember this right here is eight inches wide. It's actually eight inches by four. And I'm drawing upside down because of this awkwardness. So it's actually this fine geese unit is going to be eight by four. Now you can do two things with this. You can actually make flying geese that finishes at four, at an eight by four, or you can make two half square triangles that each finish at four inches. So that's how you would do this you can do it any way you want for your center square it's going to be eight inches by eight so that means you'll be cutting eight and a half by eight and a half inch square for your center now when some people to make it even more complicated some people will start to do different designs into their center square you can make a whole quilt and just have this star and then you can put different things inside of your square in the middle. You can put four patches, 16 patches, nine patches, whatever you want. You can put any type of star in the middle. You can put one of these smaller stars of this same kind of star in the middle. You can actually make a sampler quilt just using this one block. Hi, Aliquina. And hi, Barbara. Got two more people came in or two more people that popped up on the screen. So I'm hoping that everybody understand if we're making this into a 16 inch block. And this is something that we just saw this picture on the internet and we decided that we wanted to make it. So you really don't know from looking at it sometimes what size it really is. So let's say that we wanted to make this into a 12 inch block. Well, let me first go back over here. I'm going to put these in my cut sizes. Okay, so I just filled in for my 16 inch block where I said we would be cutting four and a half inch squares for our corners. We cut a center that's eight and a half. And then for our flying geese, they're gonna finish at four by eight. Or you can do two half square triangles for your flying geese and they'll finish at four inches. And remember those are finish sizes over here. So what if we wanted to take this block and say, okay, I want it to be a 12 inch block. So you can make a block any size that you want. The main thing to remember is that you want whatever, however many segment, segments you have, you want it to be easily divisible. It's not that you can't do it. It just makes it easier. It's easily divisible. So let's say if I want to do a 12 inch block, then these units will now be, we still got four sections that's going to be divided into 12. So now we're going to have three. These units are now going to finish at three inches. Your middle section is now going to finish at six because remember your center is always doubled and your flying geese are going to be three by six. So are we all okay with this so far? I'm I'm looking in the comments and so love said you can also put a photo of a loved one she's saying in the center square 
And that's exactly correct as well. Uh, Donna is asking, do I design my own quilt labels or do I use pre-made design pattern from my embroidery machine? My labels are very simple unless I'm doing something that's like if I'm making something that's an African quilt, I may put an African motif on my label. But basically, I just do straight typing. My goal is to just get the information so that my quilt is documented. So I'm just using basic text. And that text, the font, is included in my software. Hi, Aisha, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Hi, Diane. We got Dewana, she's here. Okay, so Erica's saying she's following me. So everybody is saying yes so far, they're good. Okay, so again, we've got We've got these sections now, they're gonna be three inches instead of four. So you'll be cutting this 3.5 because you always gotta add your half inch seam allowance. Over here, you're gonna make fine geese that finishes three inch by six inch, or you can make half square triangles that finishes at three inches. So you have your choice of how you wanna do that. And then again, in the center, you're going to be making a six inch square. So let me add this to the chart. It would be cut, your center square would be cut at Now, remember when you're doing the half square triangles to make your flying geese, you also have an extra seam that's going to be in the middle. And that to me really doesn't matter because I piece my fabrics together all the time. So you can decide which one is easier for you to make. So now we're going to go, I want this block to be eight inch finish. And again, we're still divide, divisible by our four. So if we want this now to be four inch, I mean, eight inch finish, then these sections divided by four would now be two inches finish. So now we're getting even smaller in our numbers. So these are two. And then if you're doing double of whatever these are, this is now four by two or two by four rather. Let me correct that. I'm left-handed and sometimes I like to put my numbers and stuff backwards just because it's <laughs> it's normal for me being left-handed for some reason. So then when we get into this center square, our center square is now going to be four inches finish. So let me just fill that out into the chart. So just to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that we got this. Okay, so now I'm going to say you want to make this block 10 inches. 10 inches is not easily divisible by, um, it's not easily divisible as far as our rounded numbers when we start making stuff. But it's it is doable because if you got a block you want to make 10 inches, half of this block would be five inches. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated when people when it doesn't divide in evenly divisible to what people normally are used to. That means that these sections are not going to be instead of two inches, they're 2.5 finished. And then people go, well, we don't normally make like half square triangles and things that finishes at two and a half. And that's where you have to start using your own math for sure. So it's still, it's doable. Your flying geese in this unit would be two and a half by five finished. Or if you're doing half square triangles, you would be making half square triangles that finishes at two and a half. 
and then your center square here would be five inches. So it's still doable. It just takes a little bit more work. Hi, Brenda, she's here. We also have Trisha. She said the best way to learn about resizing is to make practice blocks first. You should actually be making practice blocks on just about anything, especially if you're making a big quilt and you decide you want to cut those out. It's just always best to make a practice block before you cut all of that material out, especially as a beginner. So that's a good point. Um, Joni says she's got it. Jackie says, what info do you include on your label? Um, I'm actually, um, I'm going to talk about that because it's, it, it depends on what I'm doing with the quilt. But <laughs> I do have a video that I have already linked to this YouTube when it goes live talking about quilt labels. I'm also going to talk about it next week when we talk about if you're entering your quilts into uh, juried shows and because it's a big difference on what needs to be included on your labels. But for the most part, what I put on my label is I always name my quilt and then I put um, just basic information. I'll put the title of my quilt, my name. I also include my city and that's because if my quilt travels out of this area, it's documented that it was made in St. Louis. I have a lot of family members spread around the country and I send them quilts. So it's just another way of including some documentation on that quilt. I also include my start date and my finish date. That's as a minimum. If I'm making a quilt as a gift, I will also include that I made this quilt for and put their name. And then I will put of the occasion that I made it for, if it was for a wedding anniversary, if it was for a birthday, or if it was just because I love them, it was just a gift of love. So those are the basic things that I would include on a label. We'll talk about this in more detail next week though, depending on what you're doing with that quilt. Anna says, do you ever use triangle on a roll or angles. I talk about that in some other videos as well. I actually use triangulations. I do have some triangles on a roll that I am trying to get rid of. So I am using up whatever size that I buy. The reasons why I stopped using those two products or stop purchasing those two products is because I have to purchase it for every size. And then on top of that, I also have to store it in every size that I purchase. So what I did was I bought the triangulations half square triangle CD. It's actually a CD. It has all of the sizes up to, I think it's six inches. And it even goes in quarter inch increments or even eight inch increments. I can't remember. But it seems like every time I've needed a size, it was on there. And then what I do is I actually print it out on my printer. And I only print exactly what it is that I want to use for the project. So that works for me. Um, we have, hi, Cindy. Cindy's here from Wisconsin. She's jumping in late. She says, sorry, no problem. Whenever you get here, it's great. And then Trisha says she, uh, she learned the hard way. And I'm thinking she's talking about of making a test block first. So you should always make a test block, especially as a newbie. Erica says, I usually draw my designs out first to decide what colors go well. I use color pencils and graph paper. It is good to figure out what color combination I want to use in the block. And that's great too. I just tend to do that naturally just because I understand value very well. And I think it's sometimes it's not about color. It's more about value when you are designing something because you need some areas to recede and some areas to pop. So I think that works very well to plan it out on paper if you want to do that as well. 
And we talked about a lot of that in my designing of a quilt, which a block is part of. So I was just making it inclusive at that time because I didn't really want to get into too many numbers in one video. So that's why I cut that video short. And it looks like we are through those particular questions. I can't remember the last question I had. And Sharon says that she color blocks too, just for fun. Um, hand quilting. When I'm sewing my bindings down, I do sew, I sew that on by hand on my quilts. But if I'm giving a quilt to a family member to be used, or if I'm making charity quilts, I tend to do those bindings all by machine. But I just wanted to talk about, I like to have little pouches set up. I have about three or four of these set up when I'm doing my handwork. And what I put inside, I've already have some things out because I'm using it. But I thought I'd share it with you anyway. I always put some neutral color thread. I use, I leave some quilting thread in because sometimes I may want to base something down temporarily. And so I like this thread because it's thick a hand quilting thread that's very thick. It can be any brand. It doesn't need to be that brand. And then what I really like is that I store neutral color threads and leave them inside of the pouches. So here I have a navy blue because sometimes I can get away with it looking like it's black. I have more of a cream color. And then I have black. I will sometimes have white. And then the red in here from a previous project I need to take out. In addition to that, I might add in some needle threaders. This is a little cute one with, that has a little light on it as well. I don't know if you can see, yeah, it shows. But it's a little needle threader with a light that happens to be in this one. I also have in a seam ripper in case I sew something down and realize it's not right. Or sometimes when you're sewing binding, if you go too far into the batting, you realize your stitches went to the front. So I just keep a seam ripper in here as well. And then I also have a thimble of some kind. I do have a rock sand thimble from when I was hand quilting, but I just like this uh, leather thimble. I just buy it at Joann's whenever they have the quilting notions on sale. And I use Thread Haven, which is something to run your thread through. I just, you just run your thread through here. You hold it on your finger and just pull it through. And I use that whenever my thread is tangling. I don't have to use this all the time. But every once in a while, I have some thread tangles. And then I like to hold them down with my binding clips. So I keep a few of these uh, in my pouch as well. So I just thought I'd share that with you. And again, I have like three of those set up because sometimes you have them with projects and then you forget where it is because it's not in its right place. So I like to have more than one set up so that I'm not searching for it when I'm ready to go. So let me see what the comment sections are saying. We've got Darlene say, Erica, I do the same thing. Uh, afterwards, I make a test block. I make a practice block. If it turned out bad, so now I have to mark my quarter inch seam. Um, Trisha says, I don't know about the CD. I need to check that out. And she says, I... I did that also. She's saying to Juana, I did that also when I first started piecing. <laughs> Trisha is saying that spell check keeps changing her spelling. Yes, I hate that when I'm on my cell phone and my iPad. Uh, Liz says, T, do you ever quilt on your sewing machine? I've been using a walking foot. I'm a newbie. I also have a long arm. Every since I've gotten my long arm, I, I do not quilt on my home machine. Even uh, my little Mandela quilt that was eight by 10, I actually quilted on my long arm machine. 
it's just easier for me. I like the, the um I can stand up, I can see down on it, and it's just easier for me to do whatever it is that I want to do over me moving the machine over me moving the fabric. So I don't do it anymore, but I used to. And Darlene says she used beeswax instead of Red Haven. And that's something that you can use too. When I had the beeswax, it was in the container that you, you slide it into the slot and the slot was never closed. Or even if it did have a top, maybe I lost it, but it, it started to get hard because it didn't have a cap on it. So that's why I like Red Haven. Erica wants to know what is the ratio of quilts that you keep versus what you give away. I used to give away a lot of quilts. I have a very large family. I have a grandmother that had 12 children, and then I made quilts for everybody almost from my grandmother down. I'd say over 125 quilts that I've given to family. In recent years, I've come to the conclusion that I don't feel that they appreciate it as much as I feel like they should be. Should appreciate it and that's some of them not all of them and so i have since stopped making quilts for most of my family per se and I, i'm going to justify that with whenever i have a quilt show and i have a lot of family living in the st louis area i only have my mother and my husband and my daughter who comes to the quilt show and to me that makes a big statement I was featured quilter one year and none of my family, none of my uh, line dancing friends, none of those people showed up. So I have to take all of that into perspective with, I don't think that they really value quilting as an art. And so I have to work from there. But of course people will say, I want you to make me a quilt. But if you can't come to a quilt show and spend $5 to get in to see my stuff professionally hung, I have a problem with that. Maybe that's just me. So that's how I justify that. So what I'm doing now with quilts, I'd say my quilts, most of my quilts, I give three to four charity quilts a year that I make from scratch. I don't participate in any of my Gil's charity days. Like once a month, we have a charity day. I don't have time to attend those meetings because my time is very valuable as far as me being a one person business. So what I do to take the place of that is I'll donate a quilt or two a year to each of my guilds. So that's what I, those are the ones that I give away. Um, I have sinus problems, so you all gotta forgive me. They're flaring up right now. So I actually keep the majority of my quilts. What do I do with them? I'm mostly making new quilts to put into my lectures. So, so we're talking about lectures. I'm having a lecture in Havana, Illinois next weekend, next Friday from 1 to 4, 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. And you can contact Ma's Got a Notions Quilt Shop. But that's where I'm going to be. It's on my website under my schedule, tquilts.com www.tquilts.com has my schedule. Um, and what I do is when I go to lectures, I'm doing the scrap quilts lecture and I show you say 50 quilts. Say your Gail calls me back next year and say, we have a few people that missed it. It was really good. We want you to come back. Okay, I come back and I give the exact same lecture. Although I've got other lectures, they want this particular lecture again. What I do is I rotate different quilts. Some of them may be the same, but at least more than half of those quilts, I can then switch out and show different quilts. So I have so many quilts that you could have me continually come back and not see all of the same quilts. You'll always have something new. So that's what I do with my quilts. I rotate them around uh, through my lectures. And let me see what's going on in the comments section. Uh, Dewana is asking, how does it help? Wait a minute, let me go back down and make sure. Some people say, oh, so that was Darlene saying she used beeswax. 
Then the one says, Darlene, what do you use beeswax for? And Darlene said the thread when doing handwork. And the one of you run your thread. Let me just pull off a piece of thread. I don't need it for the project that I'm currently working on. And then I forgot to tell you that you need thread snips as well. Mine's were sitting here. So you do need to have thread snips in your cases. So if you have thread and when you or hand sewing with it and if you feel like it's constantly knotting what you do is you run it through beeswax or thread haven and i just take my end and i don't have to be on the total end of it and then i just hold this in place so i'm just pressing my thread in and it's putting a little coating of wax on it and now I didn't get this in on the far end, so I just lay it back in there, and now I pull the opposite direction. But it basically just stabilizes your thread so that it doesn't tangle as you're doing hand work. And Sharon says, wow, I'm impressed. I'm picky about who gets my quilts now. I have given most away, though. Trisha says, a word of caution for quilting on a domestic sewing machine. Please remember to work in short increments of time. You need to take breaks off and, and do not quilt for hours. Darlene says, make the thread easier to move through the fabric. Thread doesn't tangle. So they were answering Dewana's question. Liz says she gets up frequently because of her back when she's machine quilting. Erica says, I have given quilts to my nieces and nephews, my husband and my sons. I have started a new tradition of graduation quilts for kids who appreciate them. Currently my son. And, and I will make, you know, quilts as gifts. Like I had a few friends that I've made them wedding quilts. And I also will do graduation quilts. And I'm actually quilting one. It's on my frame now. And I was just making a quick tip on that. And I will Go ahead and just state it here, but I still will be uploading a video later on it. But I find when you make uh, graduation quilts, be it like when you're doing it for a particular college or university theme, I have decided to go ahead and start putting the person who I'm giving it to, putting their name in the quilt. So I'm using my carefree alphabet from AccuQuilt, and I'm actually putting the person's name on the quilt and I'm not even, um, I'm doing a herky jerky, like a zigzag, freehand zigzag, herky jerky around the outside edges. And I do that to make it so that it's very difficult for somebody to pull that out. And then I also quilt it in so that if they're pulling that out, they're also pulling out the quilting. Because I've been hearing that some people, when they go to college and they have like a college theme quilt, that their quilts come up missing. And they even have the labels on the back with their information on it. So anytime I'm making a college theme quote as a gift now, I go ahead and add the recipient's name on the front. Um, Sharon Martin says, your schedule posted somewhere. I want to attend a lecture. Right now I only have, I have, this year I haven't gotten a lot of lectures because I'm gonna be doing uh, some traveling. But right now I only have two things scheduled right now. That is the Havana, Illinois and Cape Girardeau, Missouri, which is by Southeast Mo uh, University, CMO University. Uh, so Love says, if she doesn't get a thank you, I will never make another one for you. One nephew will not receive any more of my quilts. And that's the funny thing. I'm in a family where we're in a society as a whole where people now do not even do thank you cards. You can give people wedding gifts and anniversary gifts. The majority of those people do not send back thank you cards. We're into uh, quick text emails. And I just think there are certain things that should require a handwritten note of thank you. But I have never gotten any of that for any of my quilts that I have given to friends. I have gotten uh, 
ones for weddings for my family, I mean. I haven't gotten any thank you notes from any of my family. Barely get a thank you. And when I was sending out my family quotes, I would do the whole house at one time because if you've got a a mom and a dad and then they got two or three kids, if you send one kid a quilt and the other kid didn't have their quilt, there was no way that you were going to be able to casually make the next quilt. So I always waited until I had the whole family's quilts done before I would give anyone their quilts. So I just think it's just, you know, times have changed. Sometimes not for the good. So it just depends. Uh, Dewana says, where do you get the wax from? You can, it should, all these items should be at your local crafting stores like Joann's, Michael's might even have it. And if not, I'm sure you can purchase it anywhere online. You can Google it. I'm sure Amazon sells everything. Um, some people are saying that they buy it from the farmer's market. Trisha says, I have a family member that doesn't not have any item in view in her home that I made for her. So she will never get anything else. And that's, you know, it's very difficult. And they say as crafters that once we give something, we should let it go. But I just think that we still want to be appreciated and that we're only human still. I know uh, most of our quilting do go as gifts and that's just a given in the quilt industry that a lot of us make quilts or items. It's not necessarily quilts. We're making pillowcases, we're making dresses. Uh, there are so many projects of Quilts of Valor that we're doing. So we do a lot of charity and I just think that you know, we just get underrated and people think, oh, it's only a $50 gift because they can go to Walmart and buy a quilt, a bed and a bag with the sheets, a pillow, the shams, you know. So our quilts aren't valued to me as much as they should. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She said, my mom got one for Christmas. That's Erica. Sharon says, I have a neck, shoulder and back surgeries. Can't wait to get back to quilting. Uh, Donna says they have to be quilt worthy to get a quilt. <laughs> um, Hannah Beauty Love, she said, can you guys please advise me on what sewing machine to buy? It's my first time to own and I'm a newbie. Cost is not over $1,000. Thanks a lot. Appreciate your feedback. I don't know if anyone has been responding, but let me take a quick look down. Um, Darlene is saying, Hannah, that is a good future topic. How to decide what machine would be good for you? Sharon says, people, think if you quilt, then you do alterations. Yes, I've had somebody wanting me to do tailoring and I don't do that. Um, as far as sewing machines, my suggestion, if you're purchasing a sewing machine that's at least up to $1,000, at this point, I'm assuming that you are purchasing in a machine from a sewing center. So my thing for you would be to figure out what it is that you want in your sewing machine. Do you want it to have a needle up, needle down position? Do you want to have a, a manual threader? You probably will not get an automatic threader for $1,000. Um, do you want to have the quarter inch foot included or do they have one? What's the price of that? Do they have an open toe foot? Is it included? What's the price of that? The same thing for a walking foot. So you first, before you even purchase any machine, you need to know what is it that you want that machine to do on a on a basic level. So because if you don't and you get a machine, say you want needle up, needle down, and you don't have that, and every time you stop the needles up, but you need the needle to be down, it can be a headache for you later on down the line. So that would be my first step. Second step is Go into the shop and tell the employees working there what it is that you're looking for. They know the features of all the machines in the shop. Now, you've got to be careful that they don't oversell you. 
because that can happen as well. They'll show you one that doesn't do a whole lot, and then they may show you another one that does everything, but that everything will cost you $12,000. So you need to be careful and know that, you know, these are the things that I want and I don't need the other stuff. You do need to decide if you want to machine embroider or not. And if you're wanting that, it's going to be difficult to get a machine for under a thousand dollars. So I will start with that. And then on the day that you go in, you're just test driving a machine. Make sure that you actually sew on it and then do not buy a machine that day. You can always go back and maybe go back on a day. So if you went on a weekday, maybe go back on a weekend where you may get a different person to work with. And then go back and start that process over because maybe they might show you some other machines. I think all machines or good machines, it just depends on what it is that you want. Now, what I will say is I think I have been a gun hole singer fan for many years. I started out with computerized singer sewing machines. Well, I started out with a Kenmore. And then from there, I went to two computerized singers. And I just recently purchased another singer in the last year or so. That machine is not as good as the other two singers that I've had. I think since Husqvarna Viking has purchased singer, they are purposely not putting out high quality product so that they can sell the Husqvarna and Viking line. Just my opinion. I don't work for them, so I don't know. <laughs> so that, that's where I would start. I would start with the sewing center. And I would start with one and, and fill out their customer service because that's what you're going to have to be dealing with if you need any repair work with your machine. So that's my suggestion. If you have any more questions after that, you can surely ask. And hopefully some other people gave you some ideas. We got Miss Boot Hill. She's from <laughs> Boot Hill, Missouri. <laughs> Hi, welcome. You know, I've never been to the Boot Hill in Missouri. I need to do that. Lauren's asking, do you ever quilt in the hoop using your embroidery machine? I have on small items using my Viking Epic. Yes, when I did the video on disappearing nine patches i showed you a little bitty quilt that i had finished from the scraps of one of the larger quilt and i actually quilted that on the machine i had these fancy hearts that i put into the quilt so i have used it i have a lot of designs for quilting but i've never done a full quilt i've only done maybe two quilts where i completely quilted in the hoop other than like um, I forget what you call those quilts where you work on them block by block, the window pane quilts. Um, those quilts are all, all done in a hoop as well, or some of them are. But yeah, I have done some, but I don't do a lot and I won't do any now. So <laughs> just because I got the long arm. Somebody is saying you can go to Hobby Lobby, I guess, and purchase the Thread Haven or the Beeswax. Uh, Donna says, T, you are so talented and knowledgeable. Thank you for all your valuable time. It's actually a pleasure. I just show, uh, and I have to really clarify because I'm not the expert on anything, but I just know what I would do. And anytime I'm answering questions, I'm giving you answers based on what I would do or to the best of my ability. So I'm not necessarily right. There isn't a right answer because there's more than one way, as they say, to skin a cat. So you can go get to the same end goal by going different directions. I'm just telling you what I would do. And Sharon is saying, Juki makes a great machine. And someone says that, Bonita says she likes to sing her legacy. I do have a Singer heavy duty sewing machine that I really like. That works very well. But again, it has since changed model and it has changed hands since. So just be cautious of that. My newest Singer that I have 
it stitches backwards. Just I'm stitching forward and then all of a sudden it just starts stitching backwards. Like where they do that at? I'm assuming that So Love is saying stay off eBay and test run machines. Um, yeah, I just don't recommend buying anything that you can't uh, send back or can't get any immediate help for. I think when you're spending a thousand dollars for a sewing machine, you need to be able to have some service with that machine. In most sewing machine shops, if you purchase a machine there, you have unlimited lessons there. Uh, Sharon, you've got another suggestion. 201Q. No, 2010Q. Jolene says, I corrected someone recently who called my quota blanket. <laughs> we get that all the time. And Sharon says, How about getting a vintage machine? They are workhorses. And I will agree. I recently purchased a Singer 221 Featherweight. And I do like it. I just don't use it because I'm used to piecing on my other machines. And I find that it slows me down just a little. But I think I need to take it on retreat or something and just be stuck with it. And then if I sew with it for a long time, I would be hooked. But I do love that they're very simple. Very little can go wrong with them. So that's a good suggestion as well. Jolene says she has a Juki, a brother, and two Berninas. And I think my next machine will be a Bernina. Hannah Beauty Love says, thanks a lot. It's, is secondhand machine good or bad? A secondhand machine can be a good machine if you buy it from somebody who's replacing a machine. Because they're only getting rid of it because they want one with other models. Actually, this machine here, I actually purchased from someone who upgraded their machine. This is my Elagio. They no longer sell it. And they weren't selling it when I bought it, but I knew the person loved sewing and I knew she took care of it. And so I purchased it from her. Instead of her trading it in, it was cheaper for me to buy it from her than from her to trade it in and then me buy it from the sewing center. So yes, I can work. Um, Miss Boothill says she has a singer and a brother. Sharon said, don't buy singer unless vintage. Product says going to a big quilt show will give you a chance to see different machines. And that's that's true to a certain extent. Some of them don't all show up at the shows. And then when they do, they only bring the top of the line machines, like the $12,000 sewing machines. Or anything that's like 5000 and above, I find. I find they don't bring the basic machines all the time. You have to be careful there as well. But they do have a lot of the dealers there at the big shows, like the Paducah Quilt Show or any of your AQS shows, your machine quilting shows. They have a lot of the sewing machine companies there. Um, Trisha is saying price check before you go into the shop. What I'm finding is difficult if you once a machine reaches a certain point, a certain price point, it's very difficult to find the prices online. They'll say call manufacturer when it gets to be those very expensive models. So just uh, be aware of that. The only place that I find that lists their prices is Gamble. Gamble will tell you on their website what a machine costs. They even have a little worksheet that you can put in all of the additional features you want and it will give you a total of what your quilt would be right online. And then if you wanna buy a long arm from someone else, you gotta call the manufacturer. So just be careful with that. Um, Liz says, Hannah, if you want to do quilting, make certain the throat plate is large enough. That makes it easier. H Wolf says, hi, I have a S15 needle. That's the embroidery machine, correct? I'm assuming, I think that's what that is. And then Dolina says also check the ability for maintenance. Uh, Sharon says calling a, quilt, a blanket is a sin. <laughs> yes, it is. So H Wolf machine is a commercial embroidery machine. Still want another one for small item work. Jackie K says, 
think you're right about singer. I went from Ken Moore to singer to Ken Moore. Now I'm in love with my Janome series, different price range and features. And another one, I have a friend that has a fop and she swears by her fop. So I've never heard anything negative about those from people that have it. So that's another good brand. Just trying to get through the comment section. We're at 8.05 right now. So we are going to be signing off in a little bit. Um, Diane says the Destiny and the Soprano. And those machines are over her $1,000 price mark for sure. Those are baby lock line machines. And those are definitely over the price. Darlene saying, I like to hear from UT and from the other folks doing our sessions. Well, thank you. I enjoy it because you all chat to each other. You answer each other's questions. So I like that. Uh, Darlene says, upgrading machines as you increase your skills. And uh, H. Wolf is saying yes to the, the, the machine is a commercial machine. It's a Toyota 9000 commercial embroidery machine. Trisha says, um, I did the same thing when I bought my BL Symphony person was upgrading. Yes. And I have a fall, but try for an older one. So maybe that's the thing now, because I don't know anything about that particular company. And everyone that I do know do have the older model fobs. So that's it for tonight. Look like we've gotten through the comment section. I'd like to thank you all for watching. Next week, we are talking about things you should know before entering a judge show. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences between a non-juried quilt show and a juried quilt show. So we'll do a little bit of comparison. I did have a lady come to our deal. I took some notes. And then I also have entered a couple of juried shows. Myself, I enter a whole lot of non jury shows with my quilt show, with my quilt gill. So we'll talk about that. And that is it. Don't forget to thumbs up the video. And I will see you next week at 7 p.m. Bye bye.